Welcome to the Perth Entrepreneur Podcast with me, Neil Gibb, where each week we use the stories and journeys of other successful business owners to motivate, inspire, and empower you to become the next breed of successful entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome to the Perth Entrepreneur Podcast with me, Neil Gibb. And today on the show, we have Alex Waters from multiple companies, man. You're busy boy, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I am busy. <laughs> yeah. So we've got the Waters Group, Workspace Co and Real Mark Caratha and the just released Alex Waters Podcast. Yes, that's it. Awesome, yeah. awesome. New project. So the Real Mark Caratha thing, it's, um, that strikes me because... We're down in Perth. Caratha's a long, long way away. Mm-hmm. Were you born up in that way? Or were you born down in Perth? I was born in England. You're born in England? Yeah, I thought we had this what? conversation before. No way. <laughs> yeah. Possibly. Um, yeah, so born in England, grew up in Perth from the time I was six. Right. Uh, lived in Sydney for a couple of years when I was 21. Yeah. And then at 23, moved to Caratha uh, to take up an opportunity with a real estate company up yep. there. This, mind you, this was the end of the tail end of the boom. So things were coming down at this point. Um, was that 2012? Yeah, the, the peak was sort of 2011, 2012. Yeah. So I got there, things had already started to ease off. Yeah. I thought, yeah, wow, well, I'm going to have to work really hard here to make some money. Did that, did really well, became the number one agent in the area. And then um, 2015, I set up my own agency as the agency I was working for closed down. And, uh, that was the start of Real Mark Caratha. Nice, um, nice. And so last year, uh, 2019, I um, uh, sold 50% off to a, a really good mate of mine who's now my business partner with his fiance, yep. um, Jordan and Aline. So, mm, cool. And they're up there full time? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. That, that's obviously part of the reason why is I live in Perth. We needed someone on the ground who was going to drive it and... Uh, yeah, I didn't want to live in Caratha forever. Um, right. As much as I love the place, I you know got to the age of twenty seven, been there for five years, and thought it's time to you know move on and um, start a life elsewhere. So. Yeah. Well, I used to work at Woodside, and um, they've got a gas plant up there. And yeah. the amount of people that I've spoke to that lived in Caratha, working for Woodside, they said they absolutely loved it. The lifestyle up there is yes. apparently. I've never been to Caratha. I've done Port Hedland multiple times. Yeah, but, well, that's um, nothing to compare it to. Is it totally different? <laughs> uh, Caratha is about 100 times better than Port Hedland. Is it I'm, really? I'm really sorry if anyone from Port Hedland's listening to this. <laughs> is, you know, there's definitely a Pilbara rivalry, but I think it's so clear uh, that Caratha is so far ahead of any of the other Pilbara towns in terms of um, development, opportunities, um, you know, what's available entertainment-wise, food, mm. everything. Um, if you haven't been to Caratha, it's a great place to go. It's super cosmopolitan. There's, you know, eight high, um, eight story high apartment buildings there. Right. Um, the landscape is just really not what you'd expect. I think it really surprises a lot of people. They just immediately think red dirt, yep. big mining trucks driving around, um, and it's it's totally different to that. Right. But that's basically what Port Hedland is. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Taught a lot the the thing with Caratha is uh, the mines are so much further inland. Mm-hmm. You don't really actually see much mining activity. And the ports that are at Caratha are so spread out. So you've got Dampier on one end and um, and then there's <clears throat> there's two other further ports, uh, big ports that Rio Tinto operate of, out of. And they're all, you know, uh, say 100 kilometres apart and they're kind of hidden away a bit more. So you sort of don't really see the mining activities as much as Port Hedland, whereas Port Hedland is everything coming into just this <laughs> this one port area. It's in your face, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You cannot get away from it. Yeah. So born in the UK, I, I don't know if we did touch on this before, you know. I must have mentioned Whereabouts sure. were you born? In Crawley. Sussex, Crawley, yeah. South of London. Cool. And you moved over when you were six. Yes. Right. Awesome. So moving from Perth up to the Pilbara in 2011, like what was the, what was the sort of catalyst for that? What? Why did you do it? Oh, was it from Sydney? It was from Sydney. It was from Sydney. Yeah. That's a big move again, in, isn't in it? In 2013. So Perth to Sydney in 2011. Yep. And then Sydney to Caratha in 2013. Right. <laughs> um, and yeah, I got that comment back then, like, what the hell are you doing moving from Sydney to Caratha? You know, surely that's a bit of a shock to the system. It's and got to be a big culture shock, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it was the same reason I moved to Sydney at the, at the time. It was for opportunity. Yeah. Um, I was, you know... I was born in 1990, so 2011, I was 21, 2013, 23, and I was just driven by money um, and 
I wanted to be successful. Yep. And my version of success at that point was um, to acquire as much money as I possibly could. Yeah. And hold <laughs> well, on to it. <laughs> no, no, I spent it. <laughs> spent a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I'd held on to it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's why we have our 20s, I think, to learn <laughs> yeah, learn the it. lessons to set us up for our 30s. Correct. So, uh, so yeah, the, the reason I moved is opportunity. Um, at the time in Sydney, I was working as a national sales manager for Arnest Biscuits. Right. Um, so I was pretty young in that role. And I'd been asking for a promotion consistently um, and, you know, just wasn't, was getting overlooked. Um, I understand why now. Because so of just, your age? Uh, I think my inexperience was was a huge part of it. Like I was already in a role that um, was far above, I think, what my experience said, but people saw my drive and passion and, and that's why I got into those positions. Mm-hmm. But I understand why I was overlooked because I was handling some pretty big, big things and we're still pretty um, young and immature in, in ways. Yeah. You know, it just comes with, with, uh, without age and experience. Yeah. So I made the decision to move to Karatha because um, a friend's real estate company was there. Uh, they'd been, you know, kind of promoting uh, how well they'd been doing through the boom. And I, I just thought, uh, I just saw dollar signs. I wanted more for myself, more for my life. And uh, the, the day I resigned from Arnott's, they offered me a promotion and a pay rise. And really? To keep you there? Yeah, to keep me there. So that was too a little too late. That, well, that's it. If anyone's listening from Arnott's, you know, <laughs> seven years later, <laughs> you missed out. <laughs> but truth be told, I don't, I don't think, um, you know, I actually spoke with, uh, or heard commentary for one of the senior managers at Arnott's a couple of years later, um, after they kind of seen my business journey and, uh, the commentary was, uh, he was always far too entrepreneurial for to do well in this environment anyway. Yeah. And that's the truth. You know, working in a corporate organization just would not suit me. They can see it a mile off, can't they? They can, exactly. see, they can see that yeah, entrepreneurial yeah. flair coming yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. So it's seen as rebellion yeah. in corporate corporates. So when you got up to Karatha, did you, you got straight into sales again there. So you went from a sales role, yeah. albeit in a total different industry, into a sales role in Karatha, selling real estate. Yeah. Residential real estate? Residential real estate. Yeah. Um, so I was brand new to it. I had done my, you know, real estate course through Rewa, um, the Real Estate Institute, and uh, just, you know, head down, bum up, started to sell. And, and I was there for one reason and one reason only, and that was to do well yeah. and make money. And, uh, you know, I remember um, as a real estate agent, there's a big national conference called ARIC, the Australasian Real Estate Conference. Mm-hmm. And I went to that in the Gold Coast with with our company, uh, two months into starting. And I remember seeing these agents on stage and they, um, you know, they're all talking about these guys from Sydney, um, talking about writing a million dollars in commission a year. And that's what it takes to be, you know, that's the measure of success. And so I, I thought, well, you know, what? I, I only did this for one reason and that was to be successful. Yep. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, for the listeners, <laughs> I'm, I'm putting my hands up the quotation marks. Um, <laughs> So that, that's what my, my mandate became. I was like, you know what, forget whatever limits people put on me, whatever people say about the market, whatever, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a million dollars in commission. Yep. And in my first 12 months in um, Karatha, I did 916000 Wow. in commission. And anyone listening, it sounds incredibly impressive. The agency takes a, a shitload of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I probably spent the rest. Um, and, uh, and then in my second year, it had 1.17 million and, you know, it just kept, kept going up from there. And, and, and that was what gave me the, uh, A, the cash and B, the um, confidence to start my own business in the area. Yeah, right. And when you got there and you were selling property in that first year, what was a standard four by two selling for in Karatha? Uh, I reckon my average sale price in that first year was around the 730 mark. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to give people a bit of perspective, um, in they dropped as that average price dropped as low as say 430 in uh, 2017 and then now it's probably back up to about the, the 550 600 mark I was gonna say what's that property worth now yeah. so that's not not a massive drop really not as bad as not as bad as you would have thought 700 to 500 or 700 to 400 yeah well, it was the the drop that was um, the drops that were extreme there were properties that were, um, like R30 development zoned in a pretty average area that had a old fibro home on that was a knockdown. 
you know, the development lot was selling for nine, 960 grand, for instance, but as soon as there, there was no development potential in it because the market just dropped out, so therefore no ROI on a unit development, yep. that same property um, in the in the bottom dropped to like 140 grand. Yeah. So that's where the the, the average numbers got and some of the, w- the worst losses were made. Right. So I'm yeah. guessing up there as well, just for the fewer, the sheer size of Australia, there would have been a heap of them development blocks available, was there? Fair few. Fair few. Yeah. Did you develop any yourself? No, because when I got up there, there was... Um, it was on the way it's down. Not, there's not the time <laughs> yeah. to be developing yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. So then you set up your own business, Real Macaratha. Yes. And that was off your own back or were you in partnership with anybody? No, I started that 100%. Yeah. And, um, you know, really the the thought behind it was probably like any typical salesperson or anyone who's good at what they do is like, oh, I can make more money doing this myself. Mm-hmm. Um, set up the business. And, I, you know, I think a really key part of my journey is that just a few months in, I realized um, I'd taken on more than I thought this was going to be. Right. What made you realize that? Uh, wow. Well, I was just like, fuck, there's a lot more to this than just selling, <laughs> you know, real estate now that I'm running a business. And, yep. and I think the emotional pressure of um, paying people's wages out of, you know, your own bank account, the company bank account, yep. um, just all those kinds of pressures, having to manage cash flow was before I never had to do that. So it's, it's, uh, it, there was some pretty big lessons learned in that first year. Yeah. And um, the big thing for me was about six months into the business. Um, so most people don't know, but I set up Workspace Co., my second business, three months after setting up Real Mark Carapa. Yeah, two businesses on the <laughs> yeah. at the same time. I know. <laughs> yeah. So obviously I was, I was keen and I thought, well, I've just done the first one. Fuck it. This is easy. I can I'll do it. it. You know, I've, I've set it up, got the office now. I'm going to go for it. Yeah. So I kind of took my eye off the ball and left sales to one of my assistants um, at the time in Realmark mm-hmm. and started focusing on setting up this outsourcing company, which, um, you know, we, we, we were growing pretty quickly as well. And uh, so that, that ended up meaning there was a huge cash flow hole and bills piling into the real estate business in about month six. Mm-hmm. Uh, people creditors chasing me left, right and center. Uh, you know, bank chasing me, all that kind of thing, and and a huge amount of pressure and stress. Mm-hmm. And I was I was living off uh, like twenty five dollars a week for food myself, so I just wasn't paying myself. I couldn't afford to. Um, you know, I had these two businesses that were like in this place of growth, but but struggling mm. with cash flow. And um, I basically just started at that point intermittent fasting. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Forced into it. Forced into it. <laughs> and, uh, and I used to go to Woolies and I'd buy a bag of rice and some ch- chicken breasts and uh, frozen peas and corn and I'd make a, a big batch of fried rice and freeze it for the week and that's that was what I was eating uh-huh. for about two months, I reckon. Yeah. Um, and uh, just had to hit the deck and, and get to work and actually make some money and that's what I did. And yeah. We kind of came through it. So how did you do that then? Did you did you park work space call for the time being and then just put all your energy back into uh, real mark? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. You know, I realized that I needed to focus on one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that was my core business was real mark. So yeah. Workspace Co, you know, whilst I, I loved the idea of it at the time, it, it really has only ever been a kind of a side business for me. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a really quite a great one actually you know after a while it turned into something serious and I was like wow this is a, a legit business yeah uh but yeah that's that's kind of how I did it yeah so how many staff did you have on at Real Mark Carath and when you were six months in and you said there was just a massive hole and people um, need paying I think we had four or five yeah at that point and they're all relying on you to pay them money yeah the cash isn't coming in yeah yeah did you do rentals up there or was it just sales? yeah we were doing property management yeah but at, at that point obviously starting from scratch we had no rent roll yep. and, and we're just doing sales and I was the sole income earner. So if I wasn't putting energy and time into sales, then business wasn't making enough cash flow to pay our bills. Yeah. So when you when you sort of hit the ground running again, how long did it take you from freezing the bags of rice in the freezer to getting money back in the bank and being able to breathe again? Two like, months. Two months. Yeah. Simple as that. Two to three months. Yep. And what did um, that take? A few, Just a few sales to go through the business uh, again? So what I did is I got my personal assistant at the time 
to handle all the financial stuff. Like my, my mobile my mobile was getting like private number calls every day. Like if anyone, you know. Where's my money? Well, I just wasn't answering them. <laughs> I wasn't answering them. I was so yeah. stressed like I, and I just needed to focus. So I got my personal assistant to handle, handle it. She called, you know, all our creditors, the banks, explained the situation for me. And that was a huge help because I needed my mind and energy clear to actually be able to, to bring in business again. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I just did what I did best. And, uh, and I hustled hard. I worked as hard as I needed to and, um, and, you know, made, made a number of sales and got the momentum going again. Mm. And, and that's how we, we got through. How is the, what sort of condition is the business in now? Is it ticking along nicely up there? Uh, the best it's ever been. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sales um, going well up in Karatha again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Obviously the market conditions are really, um, favorable at the moment, but I think beyond that, um, when I first started the business, all I cared about was revenue and growth. Uh, and so it didn't matter what I was spending. It was all about increasing revenue. Yeah. And uh, now the business is making more profit than ever <laughs> um, just because we've changed how we look at things and I really understand that revenue doesn't equal profit. Yeah. And money in the bank doesn't always mean profit either, does it? We exactly. learned that the hard way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, we've got all this money and then the bass comes in and you're like, oh, yeah. there goes all that money. Exactly. <laughs> So you've touched on Workspace Core a little bit there. Let's let's dig into that because uh, it's an interesting concept and that is basically outsourcing to overseas workers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we have a team of uh, remote staff, online remote staff who are based in the Philippines mm-hmm. and they support a number of businesses mm-hmm. around Australia, New Zealand, some in the US. Right. Yeah. And you set that up while you were running a business in Karatha. <laughs> yeah. Right. So how do you recruit or how do you build a business where there's people in a different country and they need direction and sort of management from someone like yourself? How did, how did you do that? There must've been some challenges there. Um, yeah. Uh, look, there's a lot of trust involved, I think. Mm. Um, the, so the, the way the business came about, I didn't just come up with this idea a couple of months into starting a real estate business and thought, oh, I'm going to do that too. I was using a virtual assistant um, had been using virtual assistants since, since uh, 2014. Yep. So for about 18 months, two years. And uh, because I'd done so well in the real estate industry, I was well known and, and had people constantly asking me to share my story and what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And outsourcing was a big part of that. Uh, the company I was using offered some really piddly referral arrangement to me and kind of like pissed me off a little bit with just with their attitude towards me, even though I'd referred them hundreds of thousands in business. Yep. So I just decided, to, I got pissed off and it was like, I'm just going to set up my own company and take these people on myself and benefit financially that way. Mm-hmm. Keeping in mind, I was just all about money at that point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so my, my personal virtual assistant, Tessa, uh, became the operations manager for the new company and because I trusted her most. So, mm-hmm. you know, she'd been handling, she'd have my credit card details for, you know, two years and, we, we just had a great relationship and trust. Yeah. She handled the recruitment um, and supervision of people in the Philippines and I handled the client acquisition in Australia, yeah. um, which mostly was word of mouth slash referral. Yeah. So we've never done any paid marketing in that business ever. How many VAs have you got in that business now? Um, I think it's about 35. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Good going. Yeah. It's- what sort, huge, of, what sort of industries are they across? Uh, so we've got some in real estate, obviously, uh, a, a few in uh, the health um, and fitness industry, uh, a number in the online coaching space and online uh, businesses now as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we kind of handle all all industries, really. Yeah. And what sort of tasks can a VA do for somebody? So if there's somebody listening to this now thinking, oh, I wonder if I can get one to do this for me. Yeah. What can they do and how how do you get that message across to them so they work exactly how you need them to work? Yeah. Well, anything can be done by anyone mm-hmm. with the right uh, processes, yep. training, uh, and guidance. And so that's just a people um, thing. Yeah. It doesn't matter which country they're from. Uh, the reason the Philippines work so well as a country to outsource to is that they have extremely high English English literacy. Mm-hmm. And I always um, fuck up saying that when I say it. <laughs> so it's always funny. Um, 
extremely high English literacy, uh, you know, extremely high rate of university and tertiary education, yeah. uh, and a, a really easy to understand accent and just a great culture. Mm. So, um, if they can, if someone can understand what you're saying to them and you're communicating clearly enough and in a, in a format that's easy to follow, um, as all leaders should be communicating in, um, then they can do anything. Yeah. Uh, the only thing they can't do is f- go visit your clients face to face. Uh, you know, they probably can't replace the creative flair or whatever your zone of genius is in your business. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my, I mean, my business is run off, uh, virtual assistants. Yeah. Like we have people doing everything in our real estate business. We have people, um, in the, our team in the Philippines handling sales contracts, administration, uh, you know, typing up leases, um, like processing tenancy applications, like everything. Yeah. And that just frees you up from all the mundane admin day to day tasks. Not not only do you get the labor arbitrage, um, because obviously part of outsourcing is that it's cheaper mm-hmm. than employing someone in Australia, but you also um you also tend to then have people who are undistracted. So and they're just focusing on a couple, one or a couple of simple systems or processes as a part of your business's workflow. Mm-hmm. So it's not like having someone in your office where suddenly they're answering calls and the next minute they're dragged over here and you're pulling them out with you to help you do this. Oh, can you go get coffee? You know, it's, it's like, oh, no, this person's sole job is to onboard new clients and uh, offboard clients. Yeah, that sounded exactly like my office there. Like yeah. you said, every, at the minute we're going through a really busy period and people are just getting pulled from pillar to post. Um, yeah, and, and we're a, a key staff member down as well at the minute, so that doesn't help. Yeah, and you touched there on systems and processes. Now, the background with myself and Alex is um, Alex started something on LinkedIn called 100 Coffees with 100 different people. Yeah, and I reached out to Alex, and I was coffee number five. Yes, yep. And we talked about the real estate business that I, I had, and at the time it was relatively young, and we had really lackluster systems and processes in place and I was I was struggling to to format them and and document them in a way that they were understandable and then Alex goes mate I can help you out with that and two days later pops around the house um, showed me exactly how his systems and processes were documented and we still use that system to this day uh, still use probably 95% of them systems that you give us as well um, and we just sort of change them a little bit to yeah. suit what we do so Thank you very yeah, much for that, man. Anytime. Yeah. And I suppose, it, like we said before, it's probably uh, more about helping you also change your mindset around what's needed in order to help your business scale, right? Yeah. I think when we when we caught up, that was almost the thing that, um, like it was it was almost the growth that you were about to experience, which you have now experienced, yeah. was going to be overwhelming because. It was like there, you know, you just didn't have that clear communication. It was all in my head. Exactly. That's, that was the problem. Yeah. 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 How, how I've got a question for you. How have you found uh, letting go of kind of what most people would see as control? Yep. Um, it was tough at first. Um, you, I think the um, the natural instinct is to constantly check up to make sure what people are doing what you're doing, but. If I'm honest with you, that they do that job better than me anyway. Yeah. And um, it does free me up to do what I need to do now. So like you said, people are good at anything that you show them how, if you show them how to do it. And um, I've showed them a minimal amount of what I needed them to do. And then the systems are there for them to, to read when they need them. But they're also very um, self-sufficient. Yeah. And um, very, very fortunate to have the people working with us that we have because... Um, definitely make my life easier so yeah. if you're listening ladies thank you very much for all your help <laughs> <laughs> but that's also a credit to you because um uh, I, I don't know how much you've shared with um your listeners about your business but uh you know from what i know of some of the working arrangements you've got like the flexible working arrangements and um like you've attracted the right people because you've, mm. you've got a really good offering yeah um there for people to work with you as well yeah yeah them flexible working arrangements they're still there but we're that busy at the minute no one's got yeah. any flexibility <laughs> no one's got any flexibility <laughs> um yeah it's an interesting time at the minute and going through some really really um busy periods but it's good like you say it's a, yeah all needs to be done 
So the hundred coffees in a hundred days, that's how we met. Yeah. Oh, hundred coffees with a hundred people. Yeah. I did start off with a hundred in a hundred days. Yeah. And then Christmas hit and then coronavirus hit. And yeah. <laughs> it just kind of derailed. But uh, yeah. So I obviously people have heard I've lived in Karatha and kind of um, 20, end of 2017, start of 2018, moved back to Perth. Mm-hmm. Um, but that whole year, 2018, I traveled around the world and spent a bit of time off and then 2019 had a had a baby went through a separation so it was a pretty broke my right leg uh my right femur so it was a pretty intense that's when we met you were recovering i still have crutches yep yeah so it was that's right yeah wow it was a long time ago it was uh i feel like that was lifetimes ago actually (laughs) so 2019 was a pretty big year and i kind of got to this place at the end of 2019 just before we met and i thought wow i had I don't really have a you know business network or people that I know in business and can interact with in Perth because yeah. I've been out of Perth for pretty much nine years. Uh, the thought of going to networking events where you know people were just handing out their business cards and and, and that kind of transactional vibe didn't sit um, didn't excite me, uh, and it kind of felt gross to be honest with you. <laughs> so um, I and and the thing is you know. I'm not, I wasn't intending to meet people in order to get business. I just wanted to, to meet people to meet people yeah. and to connect with them. Yeah. So I thought, well, what way can I do that? And I'd, I'd heard of this um, 100 Coffees idea a couple of years prior. It just came back to me. I thought, you know what? I'm going to challenge myself to have 100 coffees with 100 different people. And, yeah, I'm up to 78 or 79 now, um, so on the home stretch. And it's just been a huge journey, yeah. I think, Um a great way to meet new people, obviously. Uh, a great way to meet people and set a really clear expectation that there is no objective or intention. Mm-hmm. So you're meeting people uh, without that awkwardness or weirdness. Yeah. I found more people probably receptive to meet me because they know I'm not there to sell them anything yeah. or try and, you know, that's not the purpose behind yeah. the, the, the catch up. Um, and as opposed to going to a networking event, at least my experience of those, I've been able to genuinely connect with people because you're spending an hour, hour and a half with them. You get to know them. Um, and I think I think that's what it's all about it for is. me. Life and business, you know, it's it's about that connection for yeah. me. Well, when I seen you start the 100 Coffees, or I thought to myself, that's a pretty cool way to meet more people. And I was exactly the same. I wanted to expand my net- network. And I joined a, a BNI, mm. and it it just wasn't for me. Um, I've got nothing against BNI. I think it's it's definitely got its place there for the right businesses. But yeah. for me, just going to that same room and meeting the same people week in week out wasn't the thing that I wanted. Yeah, and I always had the idea for the podcast in the back of my mind. And when I seen the hundred coffees thing start up, I thought that's a really cool way to do it. But obviously, I can't copy Alex. Um, and then my wife bought me the microphone for Christmas yeah. for the podcast and and that's that the podcast mate so yeah. a little bit of inspiration there from you too yeah thank yeah. you no. well you, you can copy me and anyone can copy me if it's, <laughs> when it comes to 100 copies it's not an original idea and um I actually encourage it so yeah. I'm thinking of building a um I haven't spoken to this about spoken to anyone about this but I'm thinking of building a, a little app where people can challenge themselves to 20 coffees or 50 or 100 um and, uh, you know, record them and it sort of shares it to their socials and stuff yeah. like that. It's been, it's been an, a really awesome journey. Yeah. Yeah. Met some interesting people. Fascinating people. Yeah. And, uh, in some of the most unassuming people as well, right? Like people, I, I just had no idea about probably somewhere un- unconsciously was judging them a little bit or yeah. my biases were like, oh, how interesting is this coffee going to be? And just because I showed up was open to it. And, um, you know, we were both connected, uh, you know, we had, had some amazing interactions and, uh, I think tangibly as well, um, without that being any intention behind it, tangibly, there's been some huge opportunities that have come from it. Um, I've connected a couple of people who together who are now doing business together. Really? Uh, nice. Yeah. Uh, I've been, this is the second or third, this is the third podcast I've been interviewed on like since. Uh, I've met some people who have inspired me to start my own podcast yep. and um, a couple of those people have been on already. So it's just, um, 
It's been awesome. I'm really, really awesome. And that's a nice segue into the podcast too. Yeah. So the Alex Waters podcast. Yeah, the Alex Waters show. Yeah, um, uh, the Alex Waters show, sorry. Yeah. I, you know, I um, I got hung up on trying to niche myself for so long that I just didn't start. <laughs> I'm sure you know about that, yeah. as you've explained about not starting. Yeah. And so I was like, what do I talk? You know, all right, I've got to be a business podcast. I'm like, but what do I want to talk about other things than just business? And so I ended up just calling it the Alex Water Show. And and um, after releasing the first episode, I kind of felt this huge like wave of freedom roll over me. And it was like, oh, wow, I can, oh, people actually want to hear what I've got to say. Yeah. And this is my my show, so I can just talk about whatever the fuck I want, <laughs> you know, like yeah. just kind of that thing. But but before I was I was caught up in my head about so many specifics that it kind of stopped me from doing anything. I think the message there is just just get started, you know. Um, actually, the the one thing that caused me to just like press go because I I'd, I'd actually recorded three episodes a couple of months ago and just hadn't yet released them. All right. Was Joe Rogan's podcast got um, announced? A, you know, hundred hundred million dollar deal with Spotify, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've listened to a couple of his, but um, and I know who he is, and I, I really like his stuff. But I went on, went on to um, Apple Podcasts and I have a look at it. He's up to like episode number fourteen hundred or twelve hundred or yeah. something like that, some crazy number. And the the article about him signing on to Spotify says he started the podcast in two thousand and nine. And I thought, you know what, like. No, who gives a fuck about episode one? Like, obviously it's important. And I was super proud of what I was able to produce and the in, and the conversation that was had. Yeah. Well, like in 10 years time, if I just keep this going, no one's going to be looking back at episode. The only person judging it is me, yeah. basically. Right. No one else is judging it. And if they are, it's, it doesn't matter. So. And just think of all the people that you meet along the way as well. It's, yeah. It's like the hundred coffees, but expanded isn't it exactly it carries it on to the sort of the next episode the next chapter yeah 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 nice definitely excellent mate so i've got a few sort of quick fire questions i like to finish with at the end of the podcast so what what type of things do you learn or do you need to keep on top of to keep like your skills refined in the roles that you're in now within your businesses uh can you repeat the question for me? yeah so what what type of things do you learn or keep on top of so that you can keep your skills refined in the roles sure. that you're in, in your businesses. Yeah. Um, I think the number one priority for me to be an effective leader in my businesses or an effective creator is uh, to feel good in myself. Mm-hmm. And so I do a lot of meditation. Uh, I, I prioritize time for myself, really mm-hmm. prioritize my health. Um, and I spend a lot of time introspecting um, myself. Love listening to audio books, but probably not. Um, I'm not a fanatic. I kind of pick and choose. You know, a couple of months ago, I was listening to Richard, Richard Branson's story. Yeah. Uh, recently, it's David Goggins. Um, Good book, eh? Great book. Yeah. So it's kind of about like self assessing first, seeing what kind of energy I need to embody more of or, or bring more in, and then and then getting a bit of that. Mm. Just taking pit, bits of everything. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Because it's interesting that you say that because a lot of people want to find a routine that's out there for them or a situation that's out there for them so that they can just take that and implement it in their lives. But what I've found is, you know, you might take one section from one thing, one section from another thing, two sections from that thing, and then make your own routine or your own system that just suits you. And um, yeah, that basically that's what everybody else has done. Yeah. And yeah. that same thing is probably not going to suit you forever too. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. I think you change. You know, rigidity, uh, the ability to flex and adapt and change is super important. Yeah, sure is. So what tips would you give anybody that's looking to establish a business in the industries that you're in? Let's go with outsourcing. Oh, okay. Uh, stop overthinking it and just get started. That's probably with any business yeah. really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, write out, you know, the first 10 steps um, to get your business started. Uh, you don't need a fancy website. You don't need an Instagram page that looks flashy. Go out and talk to people, ask them what they need and see how you can be of service to them. Provide value. Yeah. And that's that's how you will get your first client. Yeah. So you don't need to have perfectionism. 
Yeah. Just have a little list and start making steps towards them goals. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Commit to the actions as opposed to the outcome. You know, I think the outcome is, ah, I need to start this business. I've got to have a heap, have a heap, a heap of clients. Okay, well, what are the action steps that I need to do to get that? I'm committing to the actions. Right. But, yeah, I like that. I like it. Now, I know the answer to this, but uh, what are the investments are you involved in? Uh, so I've got, um, so we've got some ha- uh, house and land packages on offer at the moment in Karatha. Yep. Um, which I partnered with a developer on. Mm-hmm. Um, I own a few shares here and there. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, <clears throat> I'm pretty focused on bringing together some pretty interesting property deals, mm-hmm. uh, looking at more ways I can uh, make money without money. Yep, perfect. So, <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure that's something you're good at. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of the the area that I'm really looking at at the moment. Yeah, yeah. nice. And you've touched on it a little bit, but what does a day in the life look like for Alex Waters? Uh, well, I, so I've got a 14-month-old son. Right. And uh, uh, his mother and I are separated, as I, as I mentioned. So mm-hmm. I have him uh, one to two weekdays a week mm-hmm. and every second weekend. So prioritizing time with him. Yeah. Uh, other than that, um, I get up, try to get up at 5 a.m., uh, most days I do. Mm-hmm. Last week I didn't at all, so I was just I was written off from not sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> from my son. Uh, so get up at five a.m. Uh, go for a run or do some stretching. I've recently committed about an hour a day to stretching because I um, have still been experiencing issues with my right leg and yep. my right hip after I broke it last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, meditate in the morning. Normally go for a, a swim because I live in Cottesloe, so I go to the beach every day. Yeah. Um, even now, I love the cold water. Yeah, I didn't go this morning because it was um, fucking stormy, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the only exception. Yeah, um, and then uh, the morning is normally free. I try not to start my work day until about nine nine thirty. Uh, that's the morning is normally when I um, start working on creative projects mm-hmm. or ideas. I've kind of got a list of priorities. At the moment, and so recently, it's been the podcast. Uh, it's been a new, a new project I'm kind of working on, which I won't talk about yet. Um, and then in the afternoon or early af- early sorry, late morning to early afternoon, I normally have my coffee for 100 coffees. Yeah. Uh, and then a couple of meetings in the afternoon, and and that's about it. Mm. Yeah, I have a pretty relaxed life. Yeah, nice. to be honest with you. Good. Um, busy but relaxed. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's more busier when you've got your son. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. Does that routine flip a little bit when he's there? Just, the routine goes out the door. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, which makes it incredibly hard. So, and when I say I didn't sleep last week, it's because, um, you know, I had him uh, midweek and uh, overnight he just, he was up between like 2 a.m. and 4 or something like that. So just the disruption to sleep is um, is challenging. Yeah. But it is. As, as it is for his mother, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what's your fr- three favorite books that have that you've read and have sort of changed the way you think or moved the needle a little bit for you? Yeah, um, definitely "Can't Hurt Me" by David Goggins. Recently, uh, I really needed to find my grit and my focus again, and and kind of that powerful energy to push myself beyond my limits. Yeah. So that that that's been a huge, huge um, change for me recently. Um, another one, uh, which completely changed my perspective on things is, um, conversations with God, uh, by, uh, his name will come back to me, but it's not a religious book, right? It's a, it's a spiritual book kind of talking about the universe and how things work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's got a lot of wisdom in there. Right. So I like that. Uh, share third book. Oh, the Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss yeah. from years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's the whole reason I started outsourcing, um, and I actually spoke on the same stage as Tim at the Australasian Real Estate Conference nice. in 2015. Yeah, nice. didn't know who he was. Heard him speak. Was like, this guy's a genius. Walked around the backstage area as a speaker to go and greet him after his speech. And I said, How do I spend more time with you? Like, you're awesome. That's a good question to ask somebody, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And he goes, oh, I don't really do that anymore. And I was like, who the fuck's this guy? But, <laughs> and so I go away, read his book, realize he's just, you know, he's this huge author and stuff like that. Mm. 
uh, probably gets requests like that all the time, yeah, which, yeah. I, which I understand why you said no. Uh, yeah, the uh, David Goggins book. Yeah. It makes you realize how hard you can physically push yourself when you read what he's been through. Um, with the hell, is it Hell Week with the Navy? Yeah, his whole journey. I mean, he ran, you know, he ran an ultra marathon uh, with like or a, a marathon with broken legs, basically, yeah. and just like the guy, the guy is insane and says like, please don't do what I've done. Yeah. Um, but to be able to take some of his energy, apply it to my own life, for me, it just it pushed all my excuses out of the way. Mm. Oh, why can't I get up at five a.m.? Well, I can. I just need to commit to it. Yeah. And and be better than than that excuse. Mm. I think it's about having finding that innate place inside uh, that doesn't want to give up, and it's like consistently tapping back into that. Mm. It's some pretty deep. Um, his story is deep and emotional. Yeah. Yeah. I think what I liked best about that audio book was after each chapter. They sort of went into yeah. it went into an interview with him about that chapter, yeah, and um, sort of asked him questions about the chapter and sort of brought memories back for him. Yeah, it's it's an incredible book to be fair. It is <laughs> yeah, to see yeah. what he's been through. And last but not least, where is your best place to eat in Perth? Who? Uh, that's a hard one right now. <laughs> it's brought out some good ones, man. I've got a good list to go well, to. <laughs> I have not. Uh, I haven't been out anywhere for a while, so I've <laughs> forgotten. <laughs> Um, oh, I've got to say Nobu. Nobu. Yeah. It's like, it's definitely up there. I went there on my, my 30th birthday this year and I, that it's kind of the place I would go to for big celebrations. Um, yeah. I love the food there. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, obviously you can go gambling afterwards as well. No, nah, not my, Getting not the not cash. my thing. No, nah, don't no. like the casino. I don't gamble. Yeah. yeah just the food. Yep. Just the Nobu. Just Nobu. Awesome. Alex Waters, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. And join us next week. And remember, every master was once a disaster and every winner was once a beginner. Thanks for joining us on the Perth Entrepreneurs Podcast. Hit the subscribe button and connect with me on Facebook, the Perth Entrepreneurs Podcast, Instagram, Neil Gibb Pep Talk, and LinkedIn, Neil Gibb.